we've looked at how self-esteem is formed, we've looked at how we learn to communicate with emotions, we've looked about at healthy relationships and, and unhealthy relationships, how they operate. And now comes the meaning of life. Now, this meaning of life is explained, as far as I'm concerned, in what was called the drama triangle by Cartman in, in Transactional Analysis, which started in the 60s. And Cartman developed this triangle to explain how we interact, the roles that we take up, how, how we uh, operate day to day. And there were three positions around this triangle. There was the rescuer, the persecutor, and the victim. Now, we tend to have a preferred position in this triangle, but once we hop into this triangle, we zap round, round and round in all directions most of the time. Most of the people that you know, including yourselves, will be operating in this triangle about 98% of the time, if not 100% of the time. It is all unhealthy, each of those three positions. And what we're going to be looking at is, what are these positions, what are they about, and how do you get out of it, which is the good news. Now, to be psychologically healthy, you need to be in what's called, in transactional analysis terms, which was the TA, you need to be able to be in a position of I'm OK, you're OK. What that means is that I'm OK, I'm a lovable, valuable person, and I deserve to get my needs met in a positive, healthy way, and you're OK, you're a lovable, valuable person, and you deserve to get your needs met in a positive, healthy way. So let's look at the healthy behaviour out here, outside the triangle. Firstly, I'm OK, you're OK. That means, in effect, it's OK for me to get my needs met and it's OK for others to get their needs met. That means I win, you win. A win-win process. Now this can only be done by negotiation rather than conflict. How do you negotiate? We're going to be looking at that in a moment. This can only be achieved by people with high self-esteem. And we've just looked at how self-esteem develops and the need for us to start communicating positively to feel better about ourselves. This uh, can only be, uh, can only happen inside outside this triangle, inside the triangle, the opposite is happening here, with statements outside here that begin with I. I feel something or other, rather than you are making me feel something or other. In order to do that, you need what we were talking about in part one, assertiveness rather than passive or aggressive behaviour. Involved in being outside the triangle in a healthy position is to feel empowered in the sense of feeling confident about yourself, to have the power and the sense to ask for what you need clearly and specifically. And one of, the, one of the most important parts of this, being outside the triangle, is it's okay not to be perfect. Because one of the most debilitating messages we have is the be perfect message, which I'll talk about in a minute. But out here, it's okay not to be perfect. 
I'm fine, acceptable, lovable and valuable whether I am perfect or not. Now that's a <coughs> the beginnings of the healthy stuff out here. In here, inside the triangle, that doesn't happen. One of the, one of the things that we do that is very, very damaging in communication is to deny, minimise or trivialise emotions. So if somebody says, I'm really angry with you about this, we will deny it, say, no, you're not angry with me, it's not about me, it's something else. Or, you've got no right to be angry with me. Oh, oh God, you're only angry about that. Or, oh, well, you know, what about the time when you did such and such? So what we do by, by communicating in that way is to deny, minimise or trivialise emotions and how they're communicated. So inside the triangle, denying, deny, minimise, trivialise. Feelings, rather than acknowledging them, which we will talk about specifically outside the triangle. There is a not okay position here, as opposed to I'm okay, you're okay. The not okay position in, in any of these triangle positions is either I'm terrific and you're not, or I'm hopeless, awful and dreadful and you're okay. So that leads to win-lose situations which then develop into Lose, lose. I feel ripped off and frustrated. You're feeling ripped off and frustrated. Everyone feels unhappy. There is no negotiation here. Inside the triangle, conflict occurs. By people with low self-esteem, everyone's feeling not too good about themselves. I'm not really okay, or you're not really okay. We use you statements inside the triangle. You make me feel such and such. Whenever you do that, it makes me do something or other else. You're making me unhappy. They are the you statements that happen inside the triangle. There is passive or aggressive behaviour rather than assertive behaviour. There is either abuse of power or a feeling of powerlessness involved in the triangle. And there is the awful be perfect message, which, which people learn at a very young age, the be perfect message. The little child who comes up and says, look at the tree I've drawn. And somebody says, oh, that's not good enough, screws it up, throws it in the bin. So that child tries a bit harder the next time. They keep trying, well, perhaps if I'm better, I'll be appreciated. Perhaps if I do better and better, I'll eventually be loved. So that be perfect message keeps us trying harder and harder and harder and harder. And it won't work. Um, now, these are the behaviours inside the triangle and the idea is to be out of the triangle altogether. How do you do it? Let's have a look at these three positions in more detail. The rescuer position. What does that mean? The rescuer says, I'm okay, I'm terrific, don't worry about me, I'm fine. I don't need anything. I'm here, I'm always available, I'm here to help you. I'm okay, you're not okay and you need me. You can't possibly cope without me. So, the position is, I'm okay, you're not okay, and you need me. The rescuer, the energy behind the rescuer, what keeps them motivated, the motivation is guilt. Guilt arising out of a constant message of whatever you did was never good enough. 
So I'm going to keep trying harder and harder and harder and giving more and more and more and doing more and more and more because eventually somebody will love me. So that's the child who, as we're talking about in the self-esteem, bank balance, gets the message, everything I do is bad, wrong or not good enough or a disappointment to somebody. So the rescuers are martyrs. They're people who are getting burnt out. They're workaholics. They're always available. Running around with their beepers. You know, just ring me at 2 o'clock in the morning. That's fine. I'm always available. No problem. Look, let me come and do that for you. Don't you worry about it. I'll take over. Because these people are desperate to do more and more and more and they're on the, they're on the, the, uh, shoot, they're on the way out. They're burnt out. They're exhausted. They're not getting any of their own needs met. It's okay, don't worry about it. You have the last piece of cake. You know, it's all right. I don't want it. Here, you have it. These are the people always giving to other people. The persecutor. Their position is, I'm okay, I'm fine, I'm terrific. I've got it all happening, I'm great. I'm okay and you're not. And it's your fault. So the persecutor is acting out of anger. The energy that they use is anger. Same position as this. I'm okay. I'm terrific. You're not okay. But the difference is it's your fault with the emphasis on your fault. The persecutor is the position where abuse takes place, you abuse other people. The persecutor will blame everyone else for the problem. I didn't do anything, it's not my fault, it's your fault. The persecutor will do. They will also humiliate other people, sabotage them. They will take revenge and they will punish others. They are the behaviours, generally speaking, of the persecutor, the person in the persecutor role. However, the persecutor doesn't have to be acting angry. 70% of our what we actually communicate, the facts, the information that we communicate is non-verbal, therefore it doesn't matter what we're saying, it's how we communicate it predominantly. Posture, gesture, tone of voice, facial expression, emotive words, etc. is 70% of the meaning is going to be communicated non-verbally. So the persecutor can actually be persecuting beautifully but acting charming. Beware the charming persecutor. The charming persecutor will be saying, but I was only joking, can't you take a joke? <laughs> is the message. Lovely fruitcake, but it's a bit dry, isn't it? <laughs> is the message. Did you buy one of those cars? Do you know, I thought you were sensible enough to read about them. They're, you know, having, they're having a very bad run on those cars. <laughs> is the message, right? This is the charming persecutor and beware of the charming persecutor. Still persecution. Then we have the victim. Oh, God, life's terrible. I'm so depressed. Nothing ever works for me. I'm so sad. Everything I do is wrong. Everybody hates me. I'll never get a job. Life is too awful for me. I just can't cope. Everything is just so awful. I'm not okay. I'm hopeless. I'm helpless. I'm useless. I'm stupid. God, I'm stupid. Uh, everything, I, you know, I could just never work out anything. I'm not okay. You're all okay and you'll have to save me because I can't save myself. Life is too dreadful and I'm going to the garden to eat worms. Goodbye, cruel world. This is the person who is feeling hopeless, helpless, and their position is, I'm not okay. You're all okay, the rest of you are fine, and you'll have to save me because I can't save myself. Now, the victim is not a powerless position. Don't 
be confused that the victim is hopeless. Because in fact, very often it's the case that the victim can, can attract the most powerful response out of all three. You go to the family gathering and there is great aunt Agatha sitting in the middle of the room like this. And everyone rushes around and says, how are you? You know, are you warm enough? Oh, don't worry about me. Would you like a rug for your knee? No, it's too much bother. I know you've got more interesting people to talk to than me. Can I get you a cup of tea? Would you like a cup of tea? You know, oh, if I have any more cups of tea, I'll have to get to the toilet. My back's so bad, you know, there's nothing more. They can. And so on it goes, you see. So everyone's rushing around the place trying to sort the victim out. It's a very powerful position. It can be extremely manipulative, as indeed can all of them. All three positions are manipulative rather than clear, specifically asking for what you need. Now, as I said, we tend to have a preferred position. You know, we might be more a rescuer generally than a persecutor, or we, we might be generally a persecutor rather than something else. But once you're in this, you zap round all three. All three positions, bang. And you can go around them just like that. 98% of the time, we're in it, and 98% of us are doing it. Home, work, school, social situations, in the family, parenting, on the way to work. Let me give you an example. You're on the way to work. You're stuck in a line of traffic and there's a car trying to get out into the traffic stream and you're sort of right there. So when the lights change and everyone takes off, you go into rescuer. Now this person isn't going to cope with it you know, if I don't stop here, so I'm going to really take care of them, I'm going to feel really good about this and I'm going to help them in, so I'm going to sort of stay here and wave them in. And they're happy and we, you know, we wave to each other, this is really terrific, everybody's happy with this. Except the person behind who gets on the horn, will you get on with it, you bloody idiot, out the window, who is in persecutor. So you're in rescuer at this point until this person starts to persecute you out the window, at which point you zip down into victim and think, oh God, everyone picks on me, I was only trying to be nice, I, I was just being really nice to everyone and every, it doesn't matter what I do, it's always wrong. And just as you begin to get very depressed, you think, how dare you do this to me? <laughs> and ever so slightly you slow down just that little bit to drive them mad because they can't get past you. So you pay them out. So you've zapped round all three positions in half a minute. Then of course we've got the classic scenario in the family. The family is the perfect environment for the triangle. Mum with two kids. Mum's the rescuer, she's got to do everything. So that's her role in the family. She's got to take care of everything that happens. So she rushes off, picks the two kids up, up from school, rushes into the supermarket, does all the shopping, packs the car up, rushes home, and she's got to get all the kids fed and, you know, Dad's got to have dinner and go out, you know, to a meeting or whatever. So she's rushing around the place as the rescuer. She doesn't ask for help or she's not specific, generally speaking, about what she needs. Now, she hops out of the car and the two kids zap in past mother. You know, they, she's struggling in with all the groceries and doing the rescuer, you know, sort of, it's all my responsibility. The two kids zap in past her, you know, fighting each other, in through, into the television, child number one. Gets to the television first, puts it on their channel, turns around and goes to the other one, <laughs> I got my program first. So child number one is in persecutor. Child number two, Goes in the victim mode. He always gets to the television first. It's not fair. I never see anything I do and nobody cares about me. Bursts into tears. Mother is in rescuer. So she looks at this victim and thinks, right, okay, I've got to sort this out. This is, you know, my responsibility here. Mother takes her right into rescuer, looks at this other child who's gone, mm -hmm, hops over into persecutor herself and says, I'm sick of you picking on your brother like this all the time. Get in your room. You're not watching any television at all. Out. Child number one is now flopped down into victim. 
Who has you want to stick up for him? You don't love me. I'm sick of this family. Nobody loves me. And off he goes into his room. As child number two, who was in victim, pops up into persecutor behind mum's back and goes, <laughs> they both swapped. Mother at this stage, who's gone from rescuer to persecutor, sees these two having a go at each other and it doesn't matter what I do, I'm a hopeless mother. I can never do anything right. They're always fighting. I'll never be any good as a mother and life is terrible and she flops down into victim and possibly even bursts into tears herself at this point. So that the other two, who've done a swap from victim to persecutor, then begin to feel a bit guilty. Hop into rescuer and say to mum, can we help you set the table mum? And they've come back in as rescuers. So everyone's gone round all three positions. Standard. And they've all gone around all three positions, usually in a couple of minutes. So it's happening all over the place. Everyone's going in all directions in the triangle. It's all unhealthy. None of it works. Everyone's feeling unhappy, ripped off, all of these sorts of things. And the question is, how do you get out of it? Now, there are some very clear formulas that I've developed to get out of these three positions. And this is a development further from the, the drama triangle to getting out of the drama triangle. Now, instead of rescuing, the appropriate behaviour is nurturing. Nurturing is guilt-free. There is no sense of feeling guilty when you nurture somebody. Let's take a, a specific example. Let's say your best friend rings you up at 10 o'clock one night, absolutely distraught. My husband's just left me after 10 years, just walked out the door, I can't cope. Life is just absolutely a disaster. The rescuer says, right, you wait right there, I'm coming around to sort this out. I'm going to pack your bags, you're coming back to stay at my place, I'll sort it out, don't you worry about a thing. Which is in fact denying, minimising or trivialising what this person's feeling, taking control and giving the message to this person that you're pathetic and helpless and you can't possibly work it out yourself. They also may pop over into persecutor and say, not only, I'll be there, don't worry about it, I'll come and sort it out. But that bastard of a husband of yours, I've got a good lawyer, we're going to get him, don't worry about that. So this friend is already in persecutor, which keeps this person even more firmly in victim. Right? That you're hopeless, helpless, you wouldn't know how to sort it out for yourself. So what does the nurturer do? There's a formula. Number one, you acknowledge the other person's feelings. Rather than, look, don't worry about it, I'll take this over, I'll sort it out, look, you know, this is awful, you know, I'm going to sort it out for you. Number one would be something like, this must be horrific, how are you feeling about it? Number one. So you're actually acknowledging the catastrophe, but still communicating with that, giving them permission to communicate with you about where they're at with it. You are not taking over and making decisions about what's happening for them. Because number two in the formula is the question, what do you need from me? That's the question. Now these are all the, the healthy parts. What do you need from me? acknowledges the disaster or the catastrophe but says also you are not a hopeless, helpless victim and you are the best person to know what you might need here. And through number three, part three of this formula is negotiate. Because if the person says, I will only be happy again if I can come and live with you for the next 20 years and that may not suit you, uh, that you need to be able to negotiate by, once again, acknowledging the feelings. 
I can understand this must be feeling horrific at the moment. Let's talk about what else we could do. Apart from that, I would be happy for you to come and stay until Saturday so that you've put in a boundary, the lines that I keep talking about. You've been very clear and said, I would be happy for you to come and stay until Saturday. After that, we will need to sort out something else and we can talk about that while you're here and look at what your other needs might be. Most of us would say, oh, um, uh, oh well, um, well, yes, I suppose you could come for a while. Now, for a while might turn out to be, in your mind, till Saturday and in their mind until next February. So being very specific and being able to say what you need and what the other person needs, acknowledging the other person and where they're at and perhaps going through this almost like a crack record. Yes, I can see that that's what you're feeling at the moment. That's not going to be okay with me. What else could we look at that might meet these needs instead? Now, if you were dealing with somebody who stayed in victim, they would say, Oh God, there's no point. Don't worry about me. I know you're too busy. I'll just, you know, there's no point. Nobody can do anything. That's an invitation to go back into the rescuer position. To zip straight in and say, well, okay, look, I'm coming around. I'll sort it out. I'm going to organise for the dog to go into a kennel and you're going to come and stay with me. No. The healthy person stays right out and continues through the nurturing behaviour. If this person is in a healthy state, outside the triangle, a new notion of behaviour, totally new. What I call assertive vulnerability. Now, assertive vulnerability means that you need to feel okay enough to be clear about your vulnerability and to ask specifically for what you need. So what do I mean by that? Assertive vulnerability, number one, it's okay to be vulnerable. Now, it's not okay to be vulnerable if you've been punished, terrified, humiliated, minimised, ignored. When you have, particularly as a young child, communicated very specific vulnerability. If you've been upset about something, terribly upset about something, and somebody's laughed at you or, or punished you, in some way deny, minimise or trivialise your feelings, the one thing you feel terrified about doing is being vulnerable about what the real issue is. So this person in victim might really want you to do something specific but would never ask. So how would you know? This person might say, the assertive vulnerability person might say, when the nurturer says, what do you need from me? The assertive person will say, Look, I'm okay tonight. I've got friends coming around tonight. But every Saturday for the last uh, five years, we've played tennis together. My ex-husband, the one who's just left, and myself. And I am going to feel very bad on Saturday because I'm not going to go and play tennis and I, can, I know that is going to be a real problem for me. And I would really appreciate it if you could come over on Saturday and we could go out somewhere else and I could stay at your place Saturday night. So what you have asked for is a specific, very specific thing that you need. So the nurturer can say, I'd love to do that, that's fine. Or the nurturer can say, I'm really sorry, this weekend I've got to go interstate for a family wedding and I can't get out of it. However, the next few Saturdays after that, I am free and I would love to do it then. Is there someone else, as you begin to no negotiate, is there someone else that might be able to, that we could think of, who could be with you this Saturday? So, the assertive vulnerability behaviour means, firstly, one, it's okay to be vulnerable. Number two, to ask. And we need to bring in the notion of specifically for what we need. Ask specifically. 
because the nurturer can't mind read. And number three, negotiate. It's a new process of understanding that to be really vulnerable about what you really need requires a great deal of self-esteem, a great deal of confidence, which, given what we know about our, our culture with the positive-negative, the bank balance growing up and the amount of negatives we get, we are likely not to have a self-esteem that will allow us to be really vulnerable. And then the uh, healthy behaviour that isn't persecution is assertive anger. Now, it is not healthy to repress anger. You know, oh, I'm not really angry, you know, is not healthy. It is healthy to, to express anger. All emotions need to be externalised. They are there to express physically, verbally, emotionally. They need to be expressed. Now, anger needs to be expressed, but it needs to be expressed in a way that is not harmful to anyone else and not harmful to yourself. So it is non-abusive expression of anger rather than what the persecuting behaviours are. So assertive anger, number one, make an I statement. I feel angry because. Da, 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 da. Not, you've made me angry again. You always make me angry when you do such and such. I feel angry because, number two, what I need is, specifically. Number three, getting a bit hard to see all of this. <laughs> number three is negotiate. And number four, consequences. In other words, a boundary, a healthy, reasonable, non-abusive boundary that goes in as a consequence. Let's have an example. I'm really angry because you said you'd be here over the weekend to do the lawns. And what you are telling me now is that you're going to the football instead. I'm really angry about that because we're having the family barbecue on Sunday and we need the lawns mowed. Now, if you're inside the triangle, the other person is likely to say, you've got no reason to be angry with me. What about when you forgot to get the dry cleaning last week? Bang! World War III on the way. Just an explosion. If you acknowledge the person, I can understand you're angry about that. Yes, I did say I would do the lawns. However, I have got a really good opportunity to go into, you know, some business contacts and, you know, the corporate box and so on. I haven't been to football for a long time. I understand that you're really angry about this. How would you feel if, going into negotiation, how would you feel if I did it first thing Sunday morning instead? Whereupon this person might say, OK, I'm still angry about this, but if you get it done before the family arri arrives, that's fine. However, if it is not done, I am not going to keep whinging about it. Intermittent reinforcement that we talked about at the beginning. Um, the intermittent reinforcement, which is if you don't mow the lawns, I'm going to do something or other, you know, dreadful, and then you don't do it. That's intermittent reinforcement. However, the consequence here would be, well, something like, if you don't mow the lawn Sunday morning, I'm not going to talk about it again. I am going to get a private lawn mowing contractor in to do the lawns and I'm going to charge it to your account. That's an example of a consequence. And you do it. You don't keep saying, if you don't do the lawns, I'm going to get the contractor in. He doesn't do the lawns. You don't get the contractor in. So then you start again uh, midweek. If you don't get those lawns done, I'm going to get the contractor in. He doesn't do the lawns. You don't get the contractor in. No doesn't mean no. Next time you say it, oh, you know, I'm not going to listen to that. Doesn't mean anything. And we parent in that way. 
with kids. We're always making wild threats. If you kids don't shut up, I'm turning the television off. They don't shut up, you don't turn the television off. If you kids don't shut up, I'm going to turn the television off. They don't shut up, you don't turn the television off. So of course the next time you do it, oh, you know, it's just them whinging again. It's irrelevant. You are encouraging people not to hear you, clearly. Providing the consequence is fair, reasonable and non-abusive. It is then put in as a consequence. Look, I've got teenagers and I find it really hard to decide what's actually appropriate. How do you decide what's fair and reasonable? That's the, that's the wisdom. And that, that, is, that is a problem. How do you decide whether, you know, your teenager says, um, look, I want to go to this party, they're 15, and I want to go to this party where there's going to be 25-year-olds and no, no parents. You know, what is fair and reasonable? And that is, <laughs> that's the problem. How do you negotiate towards a win-win situation where the parent feels okay, the 15-year-old feels okay? And that might mean a lot more information going both ways, discussion, talking it through. But it is a problem. How do you judge? And the more, uh, the, the better you feel about yourself generally, the more clear you are going to be about what is fair and reasonable. And in any specific situation, there are ways and means of talking it through and working it out, of course, except if the child is pre-verbal. Uh, if you're outside the drama triangle, how do you cope with someone who is inside the triangle? You can't be responsible for how other people will interact with you. If you're staying, your responsibility is to stay outside the triangle. And the point is you don't have to be perfect. So in fact, if you get it wrong, that's okay too. But staying outside the triangle when other people are in it is uh, a matter of not taking responsibility for where everyone else is at. It's about understanding and knowing. I think I said earlier that we need information to be able to operate in a healthy way in our culture. Now, so that means if you've got the information that you understand what people are doing and that they are in the triangle, then you don't have to be drawn into it because they're in it. And in fact, it may have a very positive outcome for them in terms of role modelling if you can operate outside the triangle. It tends to have the impact of, of bringing people outside to behave assertively. For instance, if somebody is very distressed and you say, this must be horrific, what do you need? And you can negotiate and interact. You are, more, you are encouraging and empowering that person to, uh, to be specific. You can check out without going into the rescuer position. You can check out where they're at. But if you know the skills, you put them into action, other people are more likely to be able to follow on, given that modelling. I'd like to leave you with a brilliant Michael Looney cartoon, which, for me, says it all. At this time every year, Santa Claus checks his records to see which boys and girls have been well behaved, to see which children have not been too difficult for mother and father, to see who has not been too selfish or demanding or disobedient to see who has been well brought up and is well mannered and pleasant and agreeable and cheerful and helpful and clever and good. To these children he will give a gift which could become extremely useful to them in later life. A big thick book titled Understanding Your Depression. Mm -hmm.